Your people are my, your people are my people. Your divine, my divine, where you go, where you go, I will go, ancestor. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, ancestor. Where you go, I will go. Try that. Where you go, I will go, ancestor. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, ancestor. Where you go, I will go. Welcome, everyone. Um, if you could use the chat and tell us where you're coming from, we appreciate it. It's always good to know how far we're reaching and a little bit about all of you. Um, so please, please tell us where you're coming from and tell everybody else where you're coming from too. Um, my name is Arthur Samuelson. I'm the uh, program director at the Rowe Conference Center here in beautiful Western Massachusetts. Um, we've been here almost 100 years. In 2024, it's going to be 100 years, exactly. Uh, our purpose is to help people live flourishing lives, all people live flourishing lives at all stages of their life, and we run programs for people at all stages of their life. We didn't know until recently that that included people in pandemic times, but like you, we've had to adapt. And um, our whole purpose is to bring people together in community, um, to introduce them to wonderful teachers like Taya, to um, give them great food, expose them to the beauty of nature in our environment. And of course, we can't do all of that right now, but I can bring you Taya and I can um, um, bring you each other because that's one of the great things about coming to Roe is the people that you meet. Um, we um, run summer camps for kids and adults, and of course we can't do it this summer. And then in the, the rest of the year, we run workshops on spirituality, um, personal growth, uh, all the creative arts, nature, and, and social change, and the way those things are connected. So I hope when this is all over that we'll get to see you in person. So I want to introduce Pat. Taz says that her that her um, that embodied reverence is her passion. That exquisite presence and aligned pleasure are her primary modes of prayer. She loves to play in realms of transformation, ritual, ancestral healing, and embodied vocalization. Um, she and Jill Hammer co-authored the Hebrew Priestess: Ancient New Visions of Jewish Women's Spiritual Leadership, and the Sidora Kohanit. Kohanot, a Hebrew priestess prayer book, um, which are primary texts for this movement. And with Sheikh um, Ibrahim Baba Farajaje, she co-founded Makam Shechina, community of Hebrew priestesses and Sufi dervishes, gathering an embodied, multi-gender, ecstatic, counter-oppressive devotion. Um, she serves as visiting assistant professor of the practice of organic multi-religious ritual at Star King School for the Ministry, known as the most progressive theological school in North America, where she trains emergent clergy across faith traditions in transformative ritual craft, multi-religiosity, ancestral practice, and trauma-aware spiritual leadership. Um, has, has, has recorded albums, Wild Earth Shebrew, Hallelujah, Hall 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 All Night, Torah Tantuka, and This Bliss, um, which have been heralded as cutting edge mystic medicine music. Um, Taz is also a practitioner of somatic experiencing, a body awareness based trauma healing modality, and trained in, um, in, uh, in somatic experience because of the ways it's deeply supported her own healing. And along with all of this, um, Tao also teaches ancestral healing, which is what has brought us all here today. So mm -hmm. welcome, Tao. Thank you, Arthur. It's such a great pleasure to be here in virtual row. 
magic and to be convening with all of you this day in the realms of ancestral healing. My custom is always to begin in prayer. And so we'll do that. And I invite you to attune to prayer in whatever way is resonant for you as I offer some words here to begin us. Source of creation, pulsing presence, you have so many names and so many ways. Thank you for the miracle of this aliveness. Thank you for these bodies, this breath, this day, and this opportunity to come together in this portal, in this way, turning our attention to ancestral healing. First peoples of the place where we each are, you whose bodies are this land, whose home is where we make our homes or where we find ourselves. We give such great respect to you. More than human world that is our kin. Thank you. It is a gift to be in this web of life with you. Bright and benevolent ancestors, goodnesses and guides, you who are a source of love, blessing, healing, guidance, and goodness, the bright and benevolent ancestors of me and we who gather. Thank you for the ways that you lean into our lives, support and guide us. Thank you for leaning in in only the ways that are most right to our time together this day, that it be clear, potent, filled with grace and for collective liberation. Amen, may it be so. I invite you to seal prayer in whatever way that you do. Welcome here again anew. As Arthur said, I'm Taya. Some folks call me Taya Ma. Many of you are new to me and others are dear beloveds. And I'm so glad to be gathering here with you to turn our attention to the realms of ancestral lineage healing. I wanna say a little bit about why I am up to this and how I orient in this work, in addition to the many layers of sweet introduction that Arthur gave. In my journey in this life, I have had the blessing to find ways of being in connection with the spiritual traditions of my ancestors. And I have also found ways to engage in body awareness-based trauma healing. I came into the world with a lot of trauma in my system and also a lot of intergenerational trauma in my lines. And as I found ways to heal in the body, what I learned about trauma healing surprised me very much, which is that trauma doesn't heal most effectively by focusing first on the places of distress or fracture in the system, but rather asks us to turn attention first to building positive resource, to turning our attention to what is most well, to growing our capacity to attend to what is well in the system, in the body, in the energy body, in the community body, as a resource to then tap into the places of distress from and to bring the places of fracture or trauma along, to bring that well healed resonance to what most needs trouble. And I found in my own life, in my journey, that made such a huge difference in my own capacity for presence and such a huge difference in my own healing. And yet, while I began to have more and more wellness in my own life, I found that I still struggled with the intergenerational trauma on my lines, particularly um, from two of my grandmas who were amazing women who had pretty tough lives in certain ways. And I found myself playing out patterns that very much were not mine. And no matter what I did, I was trying to fix those things here on this plane and I was trying to fix them in the ethers with my grandmas 
and nothing worked until I found a way of working with ancestral lineage healing that made sense and aligned with what I know about how trauma heals in the body. And this way of attending to ancestral lineage healing, which is known as a modality called ancestral lineage healing developed by my collaborator and, and teacher and colleague, Dr. Daniel Four. This way of attending to ancestral lineage healing asks us first to welcome connection with bright and benevolent ancestral guides on our specific blood lineages and to root in the possibility of being in the blessing of the wellness of our ancestral lines, even if that means going really far back, holding a boundary with the troubled dead on those lines and welcoming connection with the well ones in our lives and eventually getting support from the well ones to heal up the trouble later or perhaps more recently in the lines. And when I turned attention to the ancestral body in that way, rooting in positive resource, I was amazed at what was possible in my own life, at the impact that made on healing my own lines. And since that time, I've trained up as a practitioner and then as a teacher and I'm one of the senior teachers in this way. And I've had the blessing of working with thousands of folks to support them connecting with bright and loving ancestors in their lineages. And my hope and desire here today is to share with you a bit about this way of approaching ancestral lineage healing with the hope that it can be, bring goodness and possibility to you in your life. And in our time together today, we're gonna to be up to three things. I'm gonna be talking a bit about this way of understanding ancestral lineage healing and working in the realm of the ancestors. I'm gonna be answering some questions that come from you in the chat if they do. And I'm also gonna drop us in towards the end of our time together to invite you into an experience of welcoming connection with your bright and benevolent ancestors. And before we get to that part, we will have laid some basic foundations. And before we drop in, I'll also answer some questions to make sure everyone feels good about the practice and we'll trust you being in that meditation in whatever way is most right for you. My custom is sometimes to stop and listen in to just see what's needed in the moment. And so if you hear a moment of silence that's not something being dropped it's just a listening for what's most ripe now as we enter into our conversation i want to first invite us to turn attention to what do we mean by ancestors there are many different categories of ancestors that we each have First, there are our more than human ancestors, the creature ancestors, the ones who shaped us before humans even became humans. We all have those creature ancestors living in some ways evolutionarily in ourselves still. There are also ancestors of place, the first peoples of the place where we are, who perhaps are now Maybe we live in places where the First Peoples are still living and active. Perhaps the First Peoples, the indigenous peoples of the place where we are, are most present in the soil, their bones when buried. Those ones who are buried where we are and were for thousands of years, from where I sit, have impact and are important to bring awareness and respect and reverence to. Ancestors of place. We all, in addition to the more than human creature ancestors, also have ancestors of spiritual lineage that may be distinct from our ancestors of blood or family lineage, ancestors of spiritual traditions, which we practice or which we inherited. We all may have ancestors of craft or vocation. Perhaps you're a midwife and lean into the support of the midwives before you in a moment when you're supporting a birth. Perhaps you're a woodworker and lean in to the support and inspiration of the woodworkers before you, whether or not they're connected at all to your blood or family lineage. We have movement ancestors, some of us. Perhaps you have queer ancestors or transcestors or ancestors of the civil rights movement, ancestors who support and guide and bless the actions you take in the world and simply bless your existence, your identity and your being. 
These ancestors may be connected to your blood or family lineage ancestors, or they may be entirely distinct from your blood or family lineage ancestors. Today, we'll be speaking from here on out almost entirely about blood and family lineage ancestors. And before we do, I want to invite a ritual nod of respect to these other categories of ancestors that I've just named here. Before we turn to blood and family lineage ancestors, I invite you here to take a moment in whatever way is right for you from a heartfelt place and offer your respect and appreciation to any ancestors in the category that we just named, the loving, benevolent ones that have supported you or the ancestors of the place where you are. Offering a ritual nod of respect here, we'll take about 30 seconds in silence as we each do this if, for those who are called. Thank you to these ones. And I invite you to turn your attention back to this fear where we are together, if it shifted. And I'm glad to respond to any questions about these categories of ancestors in a bit when I take some questions. I first want to now speak to blood and family lineage ancestors. When we're speaking of blood and family lineage ancestors, we're meaning when, when I say blood ancestors, those may be distinct from ancestors of nurturance or family. Perhaps you were raised and nurtured by your blood lineage ancestors. Perhaps your family or nurturance lineage ancestors are different from that. When we speak of blood and family lineage ancestors, we're talking first of our four primary lines, our mother's 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 line, and the mother's all the way toward ancients, our mother's father's 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 line and the fathers all the way toward ancients, our fathers, mothers, 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 mothers line, and those grandmothers all the way toward ancients, and our fathers, 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 fathers line, all the way toward ancients. And of course, those are simply the primary four. There are then secondary lines and tertiary lines, and very quickly, the number of ancestors we have becomes exponential. In this way of working, we find it to be impactful to work with specific lineages rather than the ancestral body as a whole. Eventually, we're excited to harmonize and unify, but first, we find that nuancing and welcoming connection with specific lineages allows those relationships to anchor and also allows both blessing and healing to come in more strongly. And before I nuance that a bit, I want to speak to the core assumptions in this way of working, which may or may not match your cosmology or way of understanding the world. We're working with an assumption that consciousness extends beyond the living. Consciousness extends beyond the living. So what that means is that just because one dies doesn't mean that existence ends. That when one's physical body dies, consciousness essence continues in some form somewhere and what that also means then is that the ones who are are not gone but actually are still in presence available well they're not here in body the essence is still there we also are working with an understanding that not all of the dead are equally well not all of the dead are equally well. And so what that means is that just because one dies doesn't mean that they magically become in awesome shape. Maybe they had a really hard life and in death, they're also really struggling. Maybe they had a really hard life and were funeralized, memorialized in a really potent way or some other thing happened in their state shift and they're in amazing shape in the other realm. Maybe they had a really easeful life here. Maybe they were bright and shining here. Maybe they had a tough life, but were still shining here. And yet something in their process of death has them more troubled um, in, in the realm beyond. 
So mostly what we're saying here is that not all of the dead are equally well, and that the dead can change state, that it's possible for one to go from a place of trouble to be in a place of exaltation. We also are working with the idea that the experience that the living and dead can and do communicate, and the living and dead can and do impact each other. In neither case is that a one-way street. The living and dead can and do communicate, and the living and the dead can and do impact each other. And all of our work in these realms root in these core assumptions, which again may or may not be a match for your assumptions. Maybe some of these ways of thinking are new for you. I come from a tradition, Jewish tradition, in which for many thousands of years, the notion of soul presence extending beyond the body is pretty much a given in all of our texts. And yet, in the past 150 years or so, for many different reasons, having to do with um, modernity in lots of cases, um, mainstream American Judaism teaches many folks to believe that consciousness doesn't extend beyond the living. And I kind of inherited that in the milieu and was amazed and excited to discover that a lot more is possible than I thought, than was handed to me in my home tradition. And it's, it's important for me, for us to understand that for many of our people, and when I say our people, I mean our ancestors, systemic oppressions, particularly in more recent eras, particularly during forced or chosen diasporas, have disconnected us from our lineages, have severed an understanding that we get to have direct connection with our people. And in some ways, this has been an impact of colonialism. And um, many of us, well, it's important to not use decolonization as a metaphor in solidarity with the very real struggles for land rights among indigenous peoples. In a way, this work could be understood as decolonizing our relationship with the dead, of letting it be possible that we get to have direct connection with our ancestors. And particularly, we get to invite, welcome, and tend direct connection with our bright and benevolent ancestors. And often, when I encounter folks who are new to the work, the very first thing I hear people say is, but I don't have any bright and loving ancestors. My lines are a mess. And what I invite you to consider, if that's something that feels true for you, please remember that your ancestors don't just mean your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, your great-great-great-grandparents, that your ancestors include ones all the way toward ancients, and that you don't need necessarily to go back rung by rung by rung through the trouble to welcome connection with the brightness and the loving support on your lines. And in this way of working, in fact, our focus is establishing a boundary with the spots of trouble on our lineages, claiming sovereignty from that, getting it up out of our bodies and our energy bodies, establishing space not to abandon them, establishing space so that we can extend awareness further back, welcome connection with a bright and loving presence on those lineages, receive blessing from that one or those ones, cultivate relationship and connection, learn about the gifts of the line, tend our relationship with them, and eventually ask those bright and loving ones, perhaps very far back, to bring healing down through the line to the more recent dead, to bring healing through the spots of trouble, to get help from those ones, that we as the living face of our lineages are not always or not often the most effective at turning back and wrestling with that trouble. Rather, it's more effective to establish a boundary with the trouble, welcome connection with the wellness, ask those well ones to bring healing down the line, partnering with them as they do that, and allowing the ones who are more troubled to get help from one's way more effective than us to offer the help. And so it's not an abandonment, but rather a restructuring, being in right relationship so that the most potent support can be accessed.
I've said a lot here and I wanna pause for questions and I'm seeing that, ah, there's a lot in the chat, but mostly what's in the chat is hearing the states and cities where you're from. I'm gonna take a breath here to see if anyone has questions about these strands that I've just named. It might be questions of clarification, it might be asking for nuance, or it might be a pushing back. Perhaps you don't resonate with something, perhaps you really resonate with something. I'm gonna share some more layers here about how we work, but first I wanna to pause to see what, what needs nuancing, if anything does. I see one. How can I reach out to those ancestors? Great. We're gonna be doing a bit of work on that today. And I'll describe it a bit in, in the next layer and then we'll actually dive in to a little work. Anything else here before we keep rolling? How do we know they want to contact us? This is a great question. They may, and then I see the reincarnation one. How do we know they want to contact us? They may or may not actually want to contact us and we get to extend the invitation and the welcome. When folks initially drop in to connect with bright and well loving benevolent ancestors on a given line, sometimes they find that a guide is right there. That a guide is like, I have been waiting for you for a thousand years. Thank you for asking, let's do this. And there's so much joy and they're just like showering blessings. That very same person might turn to another line, knock on that door, welcoming connection with a bright and benevolent ancestral guide, and find so much blank space, so much difficulty finding one on that line. And it may be that no one has paid attention to that line for a thousand years, and so the ancient ones, the guides, the benevolent ones are turned entirely in a different direction, are not expecting anyone to knock on that door. And it takes a few times, a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years of knocking to get their attention. It may be that there's a guide who the door is knocked on and they're like, where have you been? But not in an excited way, but like, where have you been? Like, why has no one been tending us? And then that gets to be a conversation or a negotiation there. And so we don't always know that they wanna be in touch with us, but more often than not with the thousands of folks I have sat with, I don't know that it's the case that folks have really ever not found goodness somewhere, that there are far enough back, if we go far enough back beyond the trouble or whatever has been difficult, there are almost always benevolent and loving presences that want to be our support. I'm gonna to turn to next questions. How does this relate to reincarnation? It's a great question. And what I'll say here is that this doesn't particularly negate or support reincarnation. The way I understand it, for those who do believe in reincarnation is that say, so I'm gonna be pointing to a line, like this is my visual here of a lineage behind me. I'm gonna kind of move back so you can see my whole arm. Say there's this line behind me and there's one many generations back on this line. If that one reincarnates, say they jump back in on this very line or say they jump back in on a totally different line. Amazing. And it doesn't negate their place in the line. So even though they're here or even though they're here, they still were in a particular place on the line. So as the lineage healing work happens, they still get healed and welcome in the same way that any other one would. And so it doesn't, um, it doesn't impact their place on the lineage, even if they are also in multiple lineages. That's the way we understand it. And one more thing I'll say here about this is sometimes folks say, well, what if I don't believe this? What if this just doesn't resonate and doesn't make sense to me? Great. And personally, I find that believing in this way doesn't really matter. It's not really a relevant thing. For me, I invite folks who I work with to try it and see if it's positively impactful for you. For me, I find so much impact and benefit in my life. It's less about believing or not believing and more about being in practice and seeing what comes. I'm going to keep looking here in the chat. By creature ancestors, what I mean is the category of ancestors that are different than human. The ways that 
I mean, you may have a different theology than me, but my understanding is that humans evolved from creatures before us, from the more than human world, and that that evolutionary process is such that we still have the origins of where we came from in our in our cells. And so I understand um, I, I my practices of honoring the creatures, the more than human world are practices of, of reverence um, with the more than human world, the creature world, the natural world. But in terms of ancestry, mostly I'm inviting an acknowledgement that in addition to our human ancestors, um, from where I sit, we also have more than human ancestors. And this question from Jessica, are you meant to connect with all four main lines or might you work only with one or two? Everyone does it differently. Everyone starts who does this work. And if you're, whether you're working in this way or some other way of ancestral tending, I really would invite you to begin to work in specificity with one line. And you might work with one line and then complete that line. And I'll say in a bit what completing means from our perspective, and then shift to a next line and a next and a next. For me, definitely working with all four lines has been a great blessing. And I've worked also my secondary lines. And it may be that one explicit relationship of support and blessing is plenty for you. And it may be that you're drawn to keep working and really heal up your four primary lines or your eight or simply one or two. There's not really a right way. And looking at Kara's question, how does connection with these ancestors relate to the specific geographic areas that they came from? I have mixed ancestry heritages and, I'm, and I guess I'm not sure where to start. It's a really great question when we are connecting with our ancestral guides it's great to know about where they came from and many of us will be working with lines that we have a lot of information about and many of us will be working with lines that we know absolutely nothing about and those are both fine and bring different gifts sometimes when someone this is a roundabout way to get to your direct question and i'm going to get there sometimes when someone comes in knowing a lot about genealogy it's less easy to lean back into other ways of knowing. And sometimes folks come in wanting to connect with their ancestors and not knowing anything even about their mother or their father. And in this way of working, we are dropping into a meditative state and inviting direct connection and knowing. And folks know, receive information, perceive in different ways. Some folks really are more visual, some hear, some kinesthetically. And there's not a right or wrong way. Sometimes with certain lines, we may understand them to have lived in a certain place. And yet when we connect with ancient ones on that line, the ancient ones were actually in a different place because they lived a thousand years before the ones that we are most familiar with. And definitely many of us have lines that are from similar places and many of us have lines from different places and there isn't a, a right or wrong way we kind of start with a given line and then see what comes i'm just looking at more questions and after these two i'm gonna i'm gonna shift in a different direction if not all of the dead are equally well and may have been damaging in life what would be the benefit of connecting or reconnecting with them i actually would encourage you definitely not to be inviting direct connection with them. With the troubled ones or the ones who are in distress or not well, we're holding a boundary with those ones. We're not seeking to make direct connection with them. We're seeking to make direct connection with the bright and loving ones long before them and eventually to invite those ones to bring healing down the line. And it can be quite powerful to support them in receiving that healing. Often when that happens, in addition to the blessing of resolution to them, there can be things that shift or dramatically ease in our own lives or the lives of our families when that intergenerational trauma, excuse me, is healed. In terms of past lives, this question, wouldn't that complicate things because each past life has its own ancestors? Similar to what I named about reincarnation, um, I don't know, maybe I'm not understanding the gist of your question, um, but I'm just listening in to see if I can feel the nuance here. For me, I don't actually have any wisdom around past lives. It's not a, an understanding or a system I work with. I'm working with the lineage strands. And 
it may be that folks who are working with past lives understand their past lives to be on specific lineages. It may be that they understand them to be different. Our focus is really working with our direct lineages. And so I don't have much to offer in the realm of past lives. I'm sure there are plenty of folks even on this call who might have wisdom there. I wanna take a moment here to shift to next layers of our conversation. And I welcome, as I'm talking, if questions arise, feel welcome to continue pouring them in the chat and I will riff on them best I can in the moment. When we turn attention to this work, there are particular protocols that we use to support it being most safe and effective. And I'm gonna outline them here. They're also very detailedly outlined in the book Ancestral Medicine by Daniel Four, and there are places online which I'll share where you can listen to them again. And the first thing that we do when we drop in on our lines is an assessment. And by the way, I'm gonna tell you what we do, but I'm not asking you to do that now. So please listen to me, but don't go into a trans space and do the things I'm saying, because I haven't set up a safe enough container for that. We will be dropping in a bit later on the call, but not yet. The first thing that we're up to is doing an assessment of our four primary bloodlines, taking a look at each of our four primary bloodlines. So again, our mother's 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 line, our mother's father's 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 line, our father's mother's mother's line, and our father's 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 line. Also, just a, a note here that when I'm naming these lines, I am not making an assumption about the sexual orientation or the gender identity of any of the ones on these lines. I'm simply placing them on the biological lineage of evolution here. And as we're taking a look at these lines, our curiosity is first, how are these ones in spirit currently? How are these ones in spirit currently? So even when we're looking at the most recent dead, on any given line, perhaps it's a grandmother or a great grandmother and a great great grandmother. Usually we look first at the three most recent dead. Best we can, we're not looking based on story or memory. We're curious about how they are in spirit, spirit currently, simply based on what we perceive when we tune into that. It may be that they're joyous. It may be that they're grieving. It may be that they're in a tough place. It may be that things are easy. It may be that we don't see much and that there's kind of an obscure there. And then we turn our attention further back on any given line, five, 10, 15, 20 generations to what we would call the middle ones on that particular lineage. And again, we're curious about how these ones are in spirit currently to get a sense of their wellness or their trouble, any energies among them. And then we turn our energy yet further back toward the ancient ones on that particular lineage. And we ask that same question, how are these ones in spirit currently? We're curious about what the ancient ones on these lines are like. And again, we're looking in a nuanced way. So we're not like, what are all my ancient ancestors like? We're like, what are the ancient ones on my mother's, 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 mother's line? How are they in spirit currently? And this phrase, how are they in spirit currently? Notice the currently. So I'm curious not only what were things like then, but like, what are they like now? What's the energy tone? And it may be that the picture I get or the sense I get is about their lives then, but I'm not um, just assuming that the then doesn't also impact or still somehow exist in the now. So we're asking, how are all these ones on any given line in spirit currently? And then we tend to, in this assessment process, for the sake of ease, assign a number overall to the lines one to three troubled, four to six okay, seven to 10 well, because later on we're gonna wanna have kind of a, an easy assessment to track which lines are more and less well. And we're curious about if each line is impactful on our lives currently. So we'll ask, is this line of high, medium, or low impact on my life currently? And that's rarely a cognitive question. It's not something to think about. It's really getting a sense based on what you've seen or based on your own internal knowing. Does this line impact my life powerfully, directly now, or is it not actively at play in any way? And on a line that is really well, 
ideally it's both really well and high impact. If you have a line that's really well and very low impact, eventually we're going to want to turn that up so that it's really well and positively impact, highly positively impactful in your life. If there's a line that is really unwell and high impact, ideally we will turn down the impact and eventually get the line more well. So we're wanting to get a sense of is the line well or not, vibrant, healthy, benevolent, or is it troubled? And is this line high, medium, or low impact? And once we do that, we establish boundaries on the line, getting any trouble on the line up out of our bodies, out of our energy <clears throat> bodies, claiming sovereignty. <coughs> and sometimes this piece can be a big edge for folks. Sometimes, again, as I mentioned before, the notion of establishing boundaries with trouble on the line evokes a, but I don't want to abandon my great grandmother. I love her so much. Yes, it's possible to love her so much and have a boundary. So her distress or trouble is not directly impacting you, that that's your right. And in fact, just like hopefully, or I imagine you in your life would also work to establish sovereignty and create right boundaries with folks that are relationships of, relationships of distress in your life. This is also something that we can do and often really benefit from doing in relationship to the troubled dead in our lines. And sometimes this part of the process is the very most important part of the process for folks, even before welcoming connection with bright and benevolent ancestral lines, with ancestral guides, first just getting the space to not be heavily burdened or heavily uh, messed with, but just to have the space to be rather than being at the mercy of trouble in the lines. We establish a boundary with any spots of trouble on the lines and then we clear away any residual energy of negative impact that the line has had on our lives simply by intending to do so in whatever way is right clearing that away. Mm, so we are perceiving and then doing that work on one line and then turning attention to a next line, taking a look at how those ones are in spirit currently, if they are high or low impact, establishing boundaries. And we do that on each of our four primary bloodlines, not because the four primary bloodlines are hugely more impactful necessarily than the secondary bloodlines, like secondary bloodline would be your mother's mother's father's 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 line, or your mother's father's mother's 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 line, but because we have to start somewhere. <laughs> we need to find a line and follow it. Um, and so we do this work, and once we do, then we can consider which line we want to attend to first. Perhaps it will be the only line we turn to, perhaps it's the first of many lines we turn to. In the process of choosing which line we want to welcome connection with a bright and benevolent ancestral guide on, this is a moment that is an exciting one for me because sometimes folks come to this work and they assume that the place to start is the line with the most trouble. Not so. Many of us have been entrained to dive in to what's hardest. In this way of working, what matters first is that we really anchor in positive resource and we turn attention first to either lines that are most well or lines where there is clearly available positive resource. It may be all the way back toward ancient and that's all well and good, but a line where we can access some sense of positive resource, brightness or benevolence there. We turn there first so that we can shore up that resource, that support, that energy at our back. And eventually, if we do get to a line that has more trouble, we will have that resource and support with us to help anchor us as we're turning to the places of more heightened or more impactful distress. There's more I wanna say here, but before I move on, is there anything that wants to be asked or dropped in? What can be done if connection with the troubled dead happened first? Um, I don't know if I understand the question, but if I, 
I think you're suggesting what do you do if you've already been in connection with the troubled dead? And what I'd say is establish boundaries there and then you'll be reaching back to the ancestors far before that. And if I, if I didn't understand your question, feel welcome to nuance it in the chat or by taking yourself off mic. And if we didn't know the names, if we don't know the names of our ancestors or our ancestral histories, this way is a great way of working for folks who do have geneal genealogical knowledge or have the capacity to pursue it, definitely do that. And this way works both in tandem to and entirely separate from, it doesn't require a knowing. There are plenty of folks who have turned to this work and come to it with absolutely no knowledge of their birth ancestors and have found this to be a really powerful way to cultivate connection with ancestors that they didn't imagine they had access to. Give an example of establishing a boundary. For me, it's in this, in this realm, people do it differently. And for me, it's a, a setting of a container. Ra for me, rather than putting a boundary up by um, trying to keep something out, my orientation is saturating myself with my own presence, really filling up so much that other things can't get in. But establishing a boundary is really letting the distinction between you and another come into focus. And so if there's been some enmeshed energy or some merging with any trouble on the lines, it's really heightening that distinction. And that's something that you might do by creating attention on that separation. It's something that you might do by asking it to go away. It's something that you might do by enhancing your own presence. I like to establish boundaries by leaning into whatever energetic or spiritual support from benevolent powers I connect with or pray, pray to or access and really asking for support to fill my own space out so I'm less impacted by other things coming in or through. I'm going to take this one more question and then I will move on to a next layer. I have had strong feelings of connection with my father's father's mother. There was trauma in her life ending, but I felt great connection. Am I correct that she is not in one of the four main lines? And it, uh, yes, and that I should avoid connection, create boundary because of the trauma. Two things. Um, she's not in what we would call the, one of the four main lines. She would be a secondary line. That in itself isn't a reason uh, that I would say to keep from connecting to her. Um, secondary lines are also really important. Um, but should I avoid connection and create a boundary with her because of the trauma? What I'd say is just because there was trauma in her life ending doesn't mean that in her current state, she's traumatized and negatively impacting you. It may mean that, but that's a thing that I would invite you when, we're, when you're in a kind of contained drop-in to take a look at, to understand if actually she's in distress or or not and um so i wouldn't i wouldn't presume that to be the case i'm going to share a little bit more here so in this way of working once we've done the assessment we choose a lineage of focus we turn to that lineage of focus again i'm not inviting you or asking that you do this right now um we choose a lineage of focus and welcome connection with a bright and benevolent ancestral guide on this line, a loving and wise ancestral guide on this line. We extend our awareness as far back as needed toward ancients to welcome connection with a loving and wise ancestor. And so what that means though, is that we're not, it's not that you need to look back rung by rung by rung till you get to ancients. We can soar around the pockets of trouble, go back in our awareness as far back as we need to toward ancients. And from a heart place, welcome connection with our bright and loving ancestral guides. Welcome connection with a loving, <laughs> excuse me, a loving and wise ancestral guide on this line. And if one appears, it's important to check it out, asking questions like, are you a bright and well ancestor on this line? Are you willing and able to serve as a guide for me on this line? And if the answers to those questions are not yes, extending awareness further back. welcoming connection again anew with a bright and benevolent ancestral guide on this line. And if 
you ask if that one is a bright and well ancestral guide on this line and if this one is willing and able to serve as a guide for you on this line you would then also want to ask them to show you their relationship with the well ones before them you'll want to ask them to show you their relationship with the well ones before them and what you're looking for here is a guide for whom all the ones before them are well and they're in well they're in good connection with this one so they're not like a rogue ancestor not connected to the well ones before them and all the ones before them are well and so often what that means not always but often what it means is that the guides are not super recent because maybe there was some trouble at some point on the line so often the guides are further back because we want a guide who is the living not the sorry not the living face we want a guide who is the face of the well lineage because while we're welcoming connection with an ancestral guide, the point is not actually the connection with that individual guide. The point is connection with the wellness of the lineage so that we can ultimately receive the blessing, gifts, and goodness of the lineage. And so we might be working with an individual face. We might be working with a face of the line that's presents as individual, but we want it to be kind of the representative or the emissary of the well line. And so again that question is show me your relationship with the well ones before you and you're looking to make sure they're in good stead with the ones before them and that the ones before them are decisively well and then one more question you'll ask is not actually for them but for you checking in to make sure that you feel safe and good in your body while you're with them and if you don't this isn't the one for you you want a guide that you can feel safe and good with on very rare occasions, someone finds a guide who checks out as amazingly loving and benevolent and the person, the living human doesn't feel safe and good in their body because the energy is so overwhelming. If that happens for you and you're really sure it's your guide but you're also really overwhelmed, you can ask the guide to dial it down. These are relationships. It's not a monologue, it's a, it's a two-way street and we get to be in conversation just like we would in any relationship that matters to us here. I'm just looking at this question from Maria Cristina. Do individual ancestors also have the opportunity to work on their stuff and move to become light and bright? For sure. People, people meaning that the ancestors change state in all sorts of ways. And maybe that the line is super healed, that there's been all sorts of work happening on the line without you even needing to ask. It may be that you as a living one on the line asking it to happen makes a big difference as the living ones on our lines there are challenges and gifts of being here in the body there are ways of tending things that we can be up to on behalf of the line's wellness that ones who aren't in body may not have the same access to so sometimes we as the as the ones in body can offer certain tendings perhaps it's putting foods on an altar or dancing or doing other things that are pleasing and healing to the line that supports the line's wellness. Perhaps the individual ancestors in the line have had lots of healing that has been happening without any attention from the living ones. Or perhaps the living ones for hundreds of years, thousands of years have been tending really well and there's not a lot of work because the things have been so well maintained. And so this brings me to an important point the difference between rituals of maintenance and rituals of repair and so you know if you have ever had a vehicle that a vehicle that's really well maintained often needs less repair and a vehicle that's not well maintained often needs more repair and many of us find us in a situation where our lineages were maintained were tended were honored there was reverence brought to them after the ones died um, in particular ways for a long time but perhaps there have been big gaps in the past couple of hundred years or longer and maintenance hasn't been happening for many of us in this current cultural context we are in a place in our lines that repair is needed that maintenance hasn't actively been tending not exclusively but often and when that's the case um first rituals of repair Need to be enacted and eventually where we optimally get in relation to our lines is more rituals of maintenance i'm going to listen in here for a moment i want to speak to altars and then i want to take some time to actually drop us in 
It may be that altar practice is something you're really familiar with, or it may be totally new to you. An altar is a physical dedication or a physically dedicated space where a certain working or honoring happens. Daniel Four, who wove together this particular way, likes to speak of ancestor altars as depossession tools. It's powerful language, but what he means by that is that when you have an altar for ancestors that's separate from your body, that's a physical place, what it means is that the ancestors don't have to do all their working things out in your body, that there's a place that the working can happen that's distinct from you. That can be really beneficial. Having an altar can be a portal for possibility, for activation, for tending, so that things don't always have to work themselves out in here, but you can take some space from them and then return to them. You can have something active, working energetically, um, while, while it's not always inside of you. And in this way of working, we suggest that ancestor altars be altars for bright and loving ancestors, not altars for the troubled dead. Really different impacts here. And for that reason, we often don't highly encourage the use of photos on the altars for the ways that they anchor specific ancestors rather than lineage ancestors. But you also can trust what you know is most right for you around that. And there's more I can say about altars if there are questions about it, but I want to take this moment to drop us in to a little bit of work. And I'm, before I do, I'm going to just orient you to what we're going to be up to. It'll be a short drop in, no more than 10 minutes or so. And I'll be inviting you, not in this moment, but in a few moments, to drop into your body. And eventually I'll be inviting you to welcome connection with your well ancestors. And as a part of doing that, I'll invite also you to ask the troubled ancestors to step further away from your field. In this drop-in, we aren't going to be doing a highly specific protocol like the one I described. We'll be doing a more general welcoming of the wellness overall, inviting blessing from the wellness and inviting distance from the trouble. And that's what we'll, we'll be up to. If for any reason it doesn't feel right for you to do that, Feel welcome to step away from your screen and come back in 15 minutes. And if you would like to drop in, I invite you right now to get comfortable where you are and to go on this journey with me. I invite you to come into a place of additionally dropped in presence in your body. You may wanna close your eyes and let yourself sink into your chair a bit more, coming into presence with your breath and your energy, feeling yourself additionally here. And welcoming now any supportive powers or presences. This isn't yet the welcoming of your ancestors but just welcoming any supportive guides or loving presences or higher powers that show up to support you in your life. I'm feeling that loving support here with you now in whatever way you do. And inviting now, or creating now, containment in your energetic field. That might feel like establishing a boundary. It might simply be sensing where the edge of your energy body is, but letting there be a container around you so that all of what is here with you is for good and anything not that is far away. Letting that container bubble or boundary be set here taking some time with it and if you need any support setting it getting support from that loving presence or those loving presences you already welcomed in
And when all that is set, when your container feels set, shifting your attention to ask your ancestors who are deeply kind and wise and loving. Most likely these are older ones, ones toward ancient, though could be recent ones too. Ask these ancestors of yours who are deeply kind, loving and wise to draw near to your personal space, not to come into it, but just to draw near to you. Welcoming the presence of your bright, benevolent, loving, wise ancestors, even ones, especially ones from all the way back toward ancients. And you're not right now looking for names or specific details of them, just welcoming their presence. And knowing that as you are doing that, you are also gently allowing those who are not yet well, those who are troubled or still in need of healing, to take a step back from your personal space, for them to lean out. I'll say that again. Also, gently allowing those who are not yet well, who are still troubled or in need of healing, to take a step back from your personal space, to lean out. So that the ones who are more vibrant, healed, bright and loving are between you and the ones who are more troubled. Again, so that the ones who are vibrant and loving and healed, benevolent, so that they are between you and the ones that are more troubled without any judgment about the trouble, but just letting those loving and wise ones be most close to you. Taking some time here to welcome and feel those loving and wise ones, perhaps from really far back, be with you. and trusting your instinct about what is safe and good for you. Seeing if there is sweetness or blessing from these vibrant well ones that they want to offer you. Welcoming here a blessing for your life from your loving and wise ancestors, these perhaps older, more ancient, benevolent ones, welcoming sweetness or a blessing for your life from these well ones here. Continuing to invite those well ones, the loving and wise ones to draw near to you, to offer a blessing or sweetness if that feels right. And just noticing what comes without expectation, tracking any sensations you have or any images. We're gonna take another couple of minutes here with these loving and wise ones that we've asked to draw near. It may be that they come really vividly. It may be that you have just the faintest sense. There's no right or wrong way here. Just extending a heartfelt attention for the loving and wise ancestors of your lines to draw me and to offer goodness your way.
And you can tune my voice out if you need. And if you need reminding, we're just being in the sweetness and the blessing of any loving, wise ancestors from perhaps from far back who have drawn near, welcoming their support for you, whether you feel it or not, just continuing to invite that support from the well ones while any troubled ones are much further away. And if it feels right, if you feel loving and wise ones of your lines with you, again, not needing anything about story or names, just listening if there's anything they want you to know, if there are any messages here for you. And as we move toward landing this connection, I invite you to offer appreciation and gratitude if that feels true for you in whatever way feels right, appreciating or thanking them for their support and presence with you. And perhaps also if it feels right, inviting their continued support. Perhaps if it feels true, letting them know you intend to remain in connection or honoring. And inviting you in whatever way is resonant and at whatever pace is good for you to begin to shift your awareness from that attention on the ancestral realm back to your body. Noticing a place of ease or goodness or presence in your body as you complete the connection and exploration we were in. You seal that in whatever way is right and turn your attention to your body, noticing perhaps your breath or your seat or your feet on the floor. Perhaps letting movement come into your fingers or toes and eventually at right pace for you, shifting your awareness more widely back to this, the physical place where you are the time where we are together and eventually to our zoom circle in whatever way that you do welcome here mm, settling back in in whatever way supports goodness for you and i want to invite either in the chat or out loud a word or a phrase that's present for you if anything came from that experience for you, you can feel welcome to be chronicling and taking notes where you are. And if there's anything you want to speak to here, Maria Christina. So life and evolution goes on after death. Mm, from Dulcie. 
Is there anything else that wants to be spoken here from your drop in? I see Alyssa's hand. Let me. And Paula is saying, great grandma Ruby's hugs. And Alyssa, I am taking you off mute. I think that your hand was recent. I just invited you to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Hi. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to share with uh, lots of sweetness and just patience and stuff. So it was very nice and flowers. <laughs> very sweet. Sweetness, patience, and flowers. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you. Anyone else here? Flowers also for Allison. Marianne says, very powerful, many eager to give me love and support. From Lindsay, her mother's father's mother was so bright and ready. First time connecting with her. She got to see her grandpa before he was broken in the death camp, excited to spend more time with her. From Kara, a lot of sympathy. From Sarah, I received the word, ah, it was private to me. I don't know if it was intended to be private to me, but Sarah received a particular word. Marlene says, really nothing new, but lots of people were around her bubble, their bubble. And from Anne, peace and calm. From Maria Christina, strongest were the forest trees, my pets, my father and favorite uncle. Just loving energy. Feel welcome to continue. Uh, and from Rachel, hi Rachel, hand holding from a healthy, ah, uh, again, I don't know if it's private to me. Do you mean it to be private to me? Rachel chimes in with something that is private to me. Thank you for sharing that. I'm really appreciating all of what you're naming in from Nancy Trees for me too, ancestors in the trees. And so this drop in, is one that you can do whenever it feels right for you. And a reminder of what we did, we came into a place of dropped in presence, inviting loving powers to be around us, supportive guides of any kind, and then established a boundary around our field, a container. And once we did that, once we kind of got our bubble together, when we turned our attention to the ancestral realms, we welcomed connection with our bright and loving our wise and benevolent ancestors, as far back toward ancients as needed, we welcomed them to come close to our field, not to merge with it, but to come close to the edge of our personal space. And as that happens, also knowing that, asking that the troubled ones move further back so that eventually the bright and loving, the wise ones were between us and the trouble and the distress. So the troubled and the distressed ones are further back, the loving and well ones right here, close to our field. And then once they were with us, those loving and wise ones, we asked that they offer sweetness and blessing to us. And I'm just naming what we did just because you may have been in a liminal between the world state when we did it. And so just naming it so you can be tracking how you might do that again when you wish to drop in. And an invitation, that if you felt something this time, know that you can continue to return to these loving and wise ones and know that if you didn't feel something this time, you can continue to return and ask from a heartfelt place for that loving and wise, benevolent ancestral presence to be with you. I'm loving all of this that's coming forth in the chat. Thank you for those who are continuing to name what has been, has been coming here. Nissa, I see what you've got and we can follow up on that. Um, yes, yes to this goodness here. I'm just going to listen for a minute. One of the precious things about this work is the ways that connection gets reestablished or connection that already has always been gets perceived for the first time or for a new time. Some Sometimes it's the first time that anyone 
in your lines has turned attention to these ancestors in thousands of years. And I don't know what your journey is. It may be that this hour and a half together is the only time in thousands of years that this kind of connection will be welcomed. Maybe you turn in a different direction, but know that if it's resonant for you, you can keep turning to them. You can continue to welcome connection with loving and wise ancestors in this way. And there are all sorts of ways to do the work. One is really simple, the way that we just did, that you on your own can continue to drop in and weave this into your life as your regular morning practice or nightly practice or Sabbath practice or whatever is resonant for you. Or maybe you turn to your ancestors in moments of like deep need. When you're in distress, you let that be who you call on, let them help you. It may be that you want to learn more about these ways and do nuanced work with it. If so, I highly recommend the book I mentioned before, Ancestral Medicine by Daniel Kaur, which outlines a lot of details. There are also lots of ways to continue learning this on the ancestralmedicine.org website. There are lots of free talks you can listen to. I'm available if you have questions after this moment. There are plenty of practitioners, including me, who do individual session works to hold space to support people to dive more deeply. If anyone wants more information on session work, just reach out and contact me directly. Happy to share more. And we're considering, Ro, Arthur, and I, um, the possibility of a more extended online course in this, in this medium. And if uh, hopefully that will be in the works before long. And if so, you'll hear from Ro about that. I want to, when we're going to close ritually in a couple of minutes with a sweet ancestor honoring song together that will include each of our words and intentions. But before we do, I'm wondering if there are any other questions here, if there's anything important to clarify or to ask. Feel welcome to raise your hand or to chime in in the chat. Um, Taya, could I? Yes, Taya, yes. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Sarah. Yeah. Hi. Um, it's your, uh, what you've shared has resonated with me a lot, and it's not, I haven't been introduced to these terms before, um, particular, you know, the particular. And I, I've been studying, um, a language, um, you know, and, and so I, I'm doing a lot of work through um, that uh, to, you know, like invite to rematriate the language into my family and with my young kids. And I feel like truly optimistic yeah. and happy about that. And I, and I love the practice very much. And and so it's it's nice to hear this other sort of, you know, a broader scope. And I guess I feel, I, I wonder too, because it is like a very resonant time about, um, I'm like very new to prayer and very new to like really, um, like I, I um, so I don't know. Can you speak more about boundaries, I guess? Yeah, got it. I was going to speak about something totally different oh, based on what yeah. you said than boundaries. No, well, I can speak more, but your question had me in a different direction than boundaries. So I'm going to say yeah. what comes first and then boundaries. I love hearing what you're naming about language. Language can be so powerful and it can be a real gift if we do know anything about where our people come from and have any sense of what languages they might have spoken, learning even one word in that language can be such a gift to offer when we're in that dropped in space. Or if we have any way of knowing or sensing even intuitively ways that they might have prayed, perhaps words or particular prayers, or perhaps their prayer was more embodied, perhaps they prayed by smelling roses or by preparing a particular herb tea, that doing those things is such an immense honoring. And it's not always that we need to do it exactly like them. Like I've had times where I'm working with clients and their ancestral guide is like, I need you to make this tea. And the client is like, that plant does not exist where I live. Could I use this plant? And then the guide is like, maybe, or could it be this one? Like, again, it's relational. Um, and yes to if there's a language or an embodied language 
that you can pray in or that you can invite into your life, um, do that and let yourself feel how your loving and wise ancestors respond. Let yourself feel if that invigorates or, or welcomes joy. It may be that your ancestors' primary language was dance or was bathing in water or was tending goats or was any other thing. Find ways that you can be in honor of the line. And it may be that a lot of your gifts come from a particular line. Just keep listening in. Um, I don't know where the boundaries piece of your question came. So feel welcome to, to let me know in a very succinct way if there yes. was more. I think that I keep tracing a punishment narrative in every part of my life and I keep trying and in Judaism it's like a new moment for me as well and I felt a lot of relief recently to just kind of I don't know I'm just trying to interrogate it and so like warnings and things that I don't know that I'm ignorant about yes great um and I, I hear your question and can you I was reading a very long question that came to me privately in the chat that I want to answer can you say it one more time yeah, um, sometimes there's like a threat of a punishment narrative ah, yeah. right around your joy. And yeah, great. Thank you for that. Yes. So sometimes, and I'm going to come to the question that just came to me privately. It's a great one also. Um, if there's a narrative, just in the ways that many of our lines have gifts, many of our lines have burdens or, or really strong narratives that are det of detriment to us, the way I know to counter that is by again by doing the work first of rooting in positive resource that those narratives of trauma or distress um, are are most effectively transformed when we are accessing the wellness when we're accessing the benevolent support and then from a place of resource and containment we can take a look at the narratives that are troubled or troubling and um i'd say trying to like turn attention direct to or dive in full force to wrestling with the trouble, not so easeful. For example, I, this past year, um, led a week-long pilgrimage in Auschwitz, Birkenau. I would never have been able to do that without many years of deep resourcing with my people. Never would have been able to do that. It was still incredibly challenging, but because I had so much ancestral support, I was able to turn my attention to great trouble I would have been blasted fully out of capacity had I done it in a different order. And so just really encouraging you to be gentle and to rather than immediately trying to transform the trouble, keep building what is most well and then let those pieces titrate in when you can or need. Um, I want to respond, and I know we're soon moving toward close. We're going to close with a, ch a chant prayer in a few. We may go three to four minutes over. And I understand if you need to drop when you do. Um, great question about the ancient ones. And um, I spoke about reaching far back as ancients, maybe thousands of years. I'm not in intentionally only wanting to go back. I'm not, sorry. The question was, are you only wanting us to go back a few thousand years and not yet further back, knowing that humans have been around for 300,000 years? go back as far as is needed. Often, um, because of the ways rituals of maintenance and ancestor tending were happening in ancient times, not in a romanticized way, but literally there was, in many cultural contexts, much more attention given to revering and honoring the dead. Often, the guides are a thousand, a few thousand years old, sometimes 500 years old, if you are able to access further back and if energies come to you from further back, amazing. There's not, I'm not suggesting a should or shouldn't there. Only you and your people will know what's right. Um, but I'm not saying don't go back even further into human history. I'm mostly saying go back to where you can access great wellness. And on some lines, in, in my own lines, I have some lines where the guides are more recent and somewhere they're much further back. Sometimes lineage guides, not not super often, but plenty often, lineage guides may show up not even in human form, even though they're human lineage ancestors. It may be that one line is really represented by an oak tree, or one line is represented by a rose. Amazing. <laughs> However it shows up, if it holds the essence, blessing, and energy of the lineage, 
great. So I would, I would trust your knowing on it. And for folks who are new to working with embodied knowing or intuition, it's a muscle that we just keep building. And in terms of accessing information in the ancestral realms, don't expect to know all the things right away. Just continue to let yourself listen and know that awareness will build and capacity will hone the more you give attention to it. And if you need support, reach out and get it. Talk to people who are also up to this work. Feel welcome to reach out to me at any point if you have questions. And I'm gonna listen in here. I'm gonna land us with a really sweet ancestor song by one of my students, Sarah Salem. And um, I see a question, what is the goal? Before we do our closing song, I'm gonna say, answer this one. Basically, what is the goal? Keeping the positive going besides asking for help. The goal is different for each of us. I don't know what your goal is. I don't know what your best hopes are in relation to ancestors or ancestral healing, but I encourage you to consider what yours might be. It might be that you yearn to feel additional support in your life. It may be that you yearn to um, untangle ancestral trauma. I don't know what your goal is. For me, I feel excited for anyone who wants and needs to have access to the direct support and relationship with our loving and wise ancestors who also can support the untangle of any trouble. Mostly I'm excited for you to lean back into your bright and loving guides. And as we sing this song, I invite you to lean back into their support. Lean back, they say. Lean back, they say. Lean back, they say. We're right here. We're right here. Sing with me. Lean back, they say. Lean back, they say. Lean back, they say. We're right here. We're right here. Come close, come close, they say. Come close, they say. Come close, they say. We're right here. We're right here. What else do they say? Feel free to put it in the chat. Love. back 
they say, lean back, they say, lean back, they say, we're right here, we're right here. With so much gratitude to the pulsing presence that weaves us all to the first peoples of the place where we each are to the more than human world that is our kin and with so much gratitude appreciation and respect to our bright loving wise and benevolent ancestors thank you for leaning into our lives thank you for leaning into our time together we are so grateful may this inquiry be blessed and a blessing and may if it is right in ways that are right, connection, goodness, and blessing with the bright and loving ones continue be a source for good in our lives and for this world toward collective liberation. May, may it be so. Such a great gift to be here with each of you. Thank you to Roe for hosting us. Reach out if you have questions or want to connect further and be so well on your day. I'll hang out for a couple of minutes if anyone has further questions and consider our time together sweet and complete. My great pleasure.